Hello YouTube and welcome back to a brand new video. Today I am talking about tone and how you can improve it. Give me a second here while I put together my horn. It's been put in the case because I had a, I actually had a gig which was great. I did this video shoot and we all took the proper precautions and only took off our masks and other protective gear when when we weren't oh when we were shooting so i was i was doing we were set at this bar in los angeles so i just got word that we should have the video by december which is going to be cool so i wanted to talk a little bit about tone today because it Everybody knows it's an important thing, but still some people think their tone is okay, so they just kind of ignore it. But I really think that tone is, is like the most important factor in somebody's playing. Because it's your, it's, your it's your sonic fingerprint, really. The saxophonist, Adam Larson, who's a phenomenal saxophone player, I went to one of his master classes and he he said that if he if he can't practice anything else in a day he'll practice his tone so now some people may have more natural tonal abilities and they may sound great just right out the box but for others they need to make sure that they are consistently working on it and developing themselves. So I want to talk about the importance of tone and the some, some things that you can do to actually improve your tone. So your tone is, I think, well, logically, your tone is the sound that, that comes out of your horn. But when it comes to a more abstract sense of the word, your tone is what you hear in your own head. And so when I pick up my horn, I'm kind of expecting a certain sound. And as I explore the instrument more and mess with different sonic capabilities, I find that I learn what I like and I don't like. And Jerry Berganzi has this, this little picture. Let's see if I can find it here on my computer. He has a, um, let's see. Anyway, he, I may not, I, I don't want to, I don't want to waste valuable live stream time to look for this particular picture, but he has a little quote that I found where he, he says, meditate on your tone. What color is your tone? Is it purple? Is it red? Is it yellow? And is, is, your, is your tone wide or is it narrow? Is it fat or is it thin? So these are things that you should be asking yourself so that you can better understand what it is you're going for. Now you may like your tone but you may not feel like you identify with it so you you might kind of practice playing red practice playing purple i know it sounds kind of weird but your tone is such a unique thing it as i said it's your sonic fingerprint and there's a reason you can drop the needle on a record and you you know instantly it's coltrane or that it's dexter gordon or that it's Chris Potter, not that he would really have vinyl, but tone is so important. So I wanna dive into some things that you can do to improve your tone. And the first thing, and the probably the most boring thing you've ever heard are long tones. And I think that people practice long tones wrong, largely. And what I see is People think that by playing long tones, just playing the note for a long time is going to 
rapidly improve their playing. No, it doesn't work that way. When you practice long tones, it's very important to, to actively listen to what you're producing as you play them. Because you can just, you can hold the note and you're never, like, you're just reinforcing habits that were already there. But when you are actively listening for certain things as you play, then you're starting to make the improvement. So what I listen for is the resonance of a note. I listen for the the complexities of tone and I really try to bring them out. I try to get whatever note I'm playing to be the best sounding note that I've ever played. So I'm going to give you a demonstration. Sometimes I even pick one or two notes for the day and I work on each one of those notes for few a few minutes each. So it's it's not even necessarily about playing for a long period of time. It's about starting the note with the timbre and character that you want. So I think by actively listening as you play, you kind of make it a little bit more fun. Um, I know you may be scratching your head. How can this be fun? But when you really dive into the nuances of your own tone and you start noticing some results and you're like, ooh, I like that caramely, butterscotchy thing that I'm hearing. That's really great. Now let me, let me, let me find a way to bring that character into every note that I play. And it's, fr it's frustrating sometimes because when I practice, I'll hear that on one note and I like, I love that sound. I, there, there have been times like this is my favorite note that I've ever played. And how do I bring that into another note? So I'll start working on another note and then that sound will not want to come out. But it's, it's the, the act of continually chipping away at this and really, really isolating what sounds you like because when you practice when you practice this deep, your ears just, uh, they explode in size. And, you know, a few minutes later, you can, you can play the, you put the horn down for a few minutes and then you come back and you you realize how bad you sound in a good way because your ears are better and you're more finely, finely tuned to what you're actually playing on the instrument rather than what you've convinced yourself that you're playing. So I think that, that, the act of practicing is actually just being honest with yourself and being open and open to what you are actually doing on your instrument, not what you think you're doing or what you want to sound like. You you should always sound bad to yourself. In in as as messed up as that sounds, you should really sound bad to yourself. You should always you should always be aware of the things that need improvement. And that, and, and that can be done without self-judgment. It's not a matter of, oh, I'm the worst saxophonist ever. It's a, it's a matter of, gosh, I've come a long way, but I still have a long way to go. There are these things that I'd like to improve. And, and that's, I think that's, that's the relationship, a healthier relationship on your instrument. Okay, so the next tip that I'd like to offer is kind of a an extension of what the what I just demonstrated and that is to take two notes for example I'm gonna play concert F and concert G and this is kinda of like I, 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 I demonstrated these fingering exercises from the saxophonist named Henry Lindemann and you can find a link to that um, the fingering exercises in the description after this live stream is done. So 
what I do is I practice each note that I am working on in a pair, but I will do long tones on each tone so I can find out exactly what I want each of those notes to sound like. And then I will practice pairing them by playing slowly and transitioning to the next or vice versa. So I'll, uh, I might go F to G and then and, and just do that a few times until I get the, the, the interval relationship the way that I want it and the tone that I want going from one to the other and then vice versa from G to F. So I'll do a little bit of that. So right now my A is not sounding exactly as I want it to sound, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time, oh, sorry, my A, concert G, my A, concert G. I'm going to spend a little bit more time working on that A before I start working between the two. And don't feel afraid to take drastic measures when you're trying to really figure out what's going on with your tone. You know, scoop down, scoop up, pinch, pull, play with a blatty sound, play with a thin sound. You know, you want to you wanna explore those dimensions and that might kind of break you out of your shell. So it's starting to get there a little bit. I have so much work to do. It's just such, it's just such heady, focused work that it, it's exhausting to do for me. Uh, I just, I can't take a ton of it, but I really feel like going under the hood like that in your own playing is crucial to developing your intimate awareness of what you do. Because all the greats, in any genre of music and on any instrument have really really gone under the hood and they are aware of their playing to a greater detail than just about 99 percent of other players okay next i want to talk a little bit about this idea of tone matching and what i mean by that is playing notes that sound exactly like your idols. And I like this idea not necessarily as an end goal of being able to sound like exact exactly like your favorite player and in a in a way of copying them, but more as an as a uh, a, a technique of creating more awareness of what you could do on your instrument. Cuz the end goal is to sound like yourself. Unless your goal is to sound like Chris Potter or Michael Brecker, that's that's cool too. But you'll always be thought of as, oh, that's the guy who does the Michael Brecker stuff, and that'll be your identity. That'll that's the guy who does the Chris Potter stuff. And I don't know about you, but I would be I would rather be known as Brandon Wilkins, not the that guy pl who plays Chris Potter solos really well. So, or or that guy who sounds like Michael Brecker. I would be I would rather be known by Brandon Wilkins for what Brandon Wilkins does. So 
what I like to do here is I'm not going to I'm not going to play unfortunately I'm not going to play any of the audio from certain recordings but uh I just want to I'll I'll just talk about this concept. You want to you want to find like a a single note and it's just a single note from one of your favorite players, somebody you love the sound of and isolate it maybe put it in an audio program and just splice out that one little bit and play it on repeat and over and over and over and over again and until you get a feel for what the actual sound of the note is and how it's you know what's their mouth position like you can really listen in and you can hear how they hold their mouth how they tongue the start of the note if they use any tongue at all and um you you try to emulate exactly what they're doing and they they might even have like a little bit of scoop at the beginning of the note they might have they might have a little bit of vibrato what is the timing of the vibrato does it start off fast go slow does it start slow go fast or no vibrato at all so these are very you know very nuanced things and i've never had the patience to learn a whole solo in this way I know somebody like Melissa Aldana, who is an extraordinary saxophonist, she talks about learning that to that level of nuance in solos. And I've, you know, maybe this is what sets me apart from her is that I, I just don't have the patience for that. But I, what I will do is I will, I will develop that sense of ear for one note with a player and really I, maybe one or two notes for a player and really figure out what their mouth placement is like and the, but I will work on that level of nuance within my own playing my own sound but not somebody else's it 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 gets boring to me I'm just putting it out there it gets boring to me so there's this one recording uh it's uh what's shoot it it's a recording of Lucas Pino the great tenorist who lives out of New York City, phenomenal, phenomenal player. He has a group called the No Net, Na Net. And I love, love, love his playing. And I was very fortunate to get to meet him when I lived in New York for a little while. He's a very, very nice guy. There's this one thing that he does. He has this, uh, he was playing the melody on one of his tunes. Can't remember exactly which one it was. It, I think it was, uh, I think it was his, his tune, uh, Sidestep, Sidestep. And he has this slur from, from concert A up an octave to concert A. So, oh, sorry, Mike was on this guy right here. I don't want to blast your ears out. Like there's a certain vulnerability to the way that he, he plays that that higher note that really spoke to me. It's like, that's the most perfect concert A I've ever heard. <laughs> so I had to learn how to play it like that. And I, it's never gonna be quite like him, but it, the idea is like really, you're hearing something in there playing that is not what you do. And you wanna add it to your arsenal so that you can do that. It's it's really cool. So I'll, I'll give it a few goes and you'll just kind of get the idea of what, I'll play, you know what? I'm gonna start it off and I'm gonna play how I would play it. And then I'll play it the way that, that I, I hear Lucas playing, Luke, Lucas playing it. Can you hear the difference? The first one is of me playing it and then the second one is the way that Lucas might play it. I'll do it again. He has this softness and warmth in the way that he does it. It's almost breathy-ish, but it's, it, I don't know, it, there's something about it. I like it. So, fight me. <laughs> anyway, let's see. What else is there? What else is there? Okay, so let's move on to another tip here, and that is 
using overtones to to build the thickness of your sound. And a lot of people practice overtones as just a way of improving your your the, the your control of your larynx and working on bringing in overtones in your playing. But in this case, what I'm doing is overtone matching, where I will play a note with the regular fingering and then I will play another note using the overtone fingering and I will try to get the regular note to sound as thick and fat as the overtone and I will try to get the overtone to sound as as clean and in tune as the regular note. If that I hope that makes sense. So, for example, if I play a concert B flat on the tenor here. Okay, sounds like a regular note. Great. So, if I play it with the longer overtone fingering, it sounds like this. So, big dramatic difference between the two. So, I was kind of demonstrating the differences between the two, but now let me try to make the regular where the regular concert B flat sound more like the overtone concert B flat and just work work between those two. Honestly, it's really hard to do and it's not, you're never going to get it all the way because the overtone has a very, very distinct sound. Okay, furthermore on overtones, uh, by the way, do this with all the notes that you can. There aren't overtones for everything, but you can do uh, about an octave and a half of overtones within the regular note range of the saxophone, anywhere from, from... <laughs> So that's an octave and a fifth of overtones that you could do to match. So. So right there I'm using my side D. I'm talking in tenor key now. My side D and my full D fingering. So, I mean, I'm kind of losing track. I'm uh, run, getting off course here. but. You get the idea. So you're matching overtones to the original fingerings and you're trying to get that consistency of sound across. You're bringing the qualities you like from overtones and putting them into your your normal fingerings. You're bringing those that, what you hear from the overtones into your normal fingerings. Okay, so one more thing about overtones is that I like the idea of being able to play an overtone without overtones in it. So I just want the sine wave, the pure sine wave at the very, very center of the pitch. You don't want any extraneous stuff. And it's really hard to do. It's not going to be perfect. But let me see if I can bring out, take out the overtones and just keep that core of sound. You can see me right here. You can keep that core of sound at the center of of the overtone that you're playing. So I'm just going to play a concert E flat here. Now that wasn't perfect, but it, it has fewer overtones than if I were to just play it straight. Check this out. Sounds a lot brighter, right? And that brightness comes from the overtones. Now, let me try it again.
Okay, so that's a fun little exercise. I think I might have one more tip here for you. And let's see, let's see, let's see. Tone, tone, tone. There we go. Ooh, this is a fun one. Okay, so this is my last one. And this is something that I learned from George Garzon, the great saxophonist and teacher at Berkeley, where I went to college. Now, I only studied with George Garzon for a semester, but he really helped me out a lot. And I'm sure you've heard about this before. If not, here it is. So he has this, this kind of subtone tone improvement practice where he will start playing a note, but he won't actually play the note. He, he, he puts air into a note right up until the time where the note wants to speak, and then he stops there. So it's not, you're not actually producing the note. You're just developing an awareness of where the note starts. So I will give a demonstration. But what, the, what I'm doing here, I'm just going to play a concert G in the middle of the range of my horn. And I'm going to start with just air. And I'm going to gradually increase my airflow and change my embouchure so that the note wants to start speaking. And just as I feel that the note wants to start speaking, I'm going to maintain my, uh, my awareness and my, and my airflow, all of those things will stay consistent where they are and they will not break that threshold. Now, it's completely normal to break that threshold when you're starting out and you're figuring out your, your airstream and your control of all of that. But the goal is to just keep it consistent right below the point where the note wants to speak. So here we go. Now I realize that that probably sounded like just whooshing to you on your end. And that's kind of what it is on this end too. But what I, what the difference is, is that I feel, I feel the note just starting to vibrate, but not quite. And if you do this for 15 minutes, you try to do it on as many notes as you can, you put your horn down for another 15 minutes and you come back. I guarantee that you will feel like you have an explosive sound. So there is that, and I owe that one to George Garzon. That's a really cool technique right there. What you're doing is you're, you're, you, when you're more aware of where the note starts, your timing all of a sudden gets better, and your, your, your lining of your, the air in your fingers gets better. So that's probably it for today. In fact, it is it for today. And if you got any value of this out of this video, please like and subscribe because I put out a new video just about every day. If you have any ideas about this video or any ideas for some topics you'd like me to discuss, please leave a comment below. And thank you for tuning in. I'm going to end it right here on a... Uh on a on a low note <laughs> thanks guys i'll see you next time